Baldur's Gate 3 is many things to many people, often all at once. To some it's simply a masterpiece of modern CRPG excellence, to others it's a wake up call for a game industry suffering from the crippling pestilence of in-game monetization. To some yet, yeah, it's a repository of hardcore but for the majority of its up to 20 million strong player base, it was just a new, profoundly fresh experience. And I believe that by unwrapping this new perspective, we can really begin to understand what made Baldur's Gate 3 the tremendous success it was. Something I'm well equipped to do because you see, Baldur's Gate 3 was my first, the title that popped my CRPG cherry. You see, as a regular person who sometimes seeks gratification in ways that don't involve saving NPCs from goblins, I had never played a CRPG before. And so despite everyone and their necromantically raised mum praising the game to no end, I was a little apprehensive venturing into Faerun for the first time. The CRPG genre isn't exactly known for its welcoming spirit. Even the name itself conveys a self-satisfying and frankly uncalled for elitism. A J was added onto Japanese role-playing games to recognize their uniquely Japanese style and aesthetic, whereas the C in CRPG simply means computer. Yes, computer. A relic from the days of old when one had to differentiate between computer and tabletop role-playing that nowadays conveys nothing but a sense of pride in not embracing and change past 1998. So I was pleasantly surprised that Baldur's Gate 3 was nothing like this. In fact, it was the complete opposite. When I launched the game, instead of being instantly redirected to a 5,000 page manual laid on parchment, I was instantly hooked in by a modern feature known as the cinematic. And thereafter found myself drawn into a world full of amazing stories and characters, underpinned by a vast cacophony of narrative choices and an even greater range of consequences that would usually end up in hardcore. But for me, the real highlight of the the game was in its fantastically intricate but also user-friendly turn-based combat system. You see, I've always had a spot for turn-based systems. Anyone who grew up in the 2000s will remember the era when Nintendo was the dominant fad. At the time, they were a sort of corporate Pied Piper, directing armies of kids to bolster share prices by buying their IP with a frenzy not seen since Michael Jackson. In my case, I was sold on Pokemon. The prospect of hunting furries in and around air-conditioned gyms with friends seemed too good to turn down. So I begged my parents for a shiny new DS with the latest Pokemon in tow. And when I finally got hold of my prize, it didn't take me long to realize that this would be no mere fad. The moment I loaded the game, the feeling of excitement and intense focus that flooded my brain would inaugurate the start of a brutal addiction to the most Japanese of drug, the turn-based RPG. You see, as I played through Platinum's nonsensical narrative, battling from gym to gym, my fantasies of catching them all with my friends brushed to the wayside as I became obsessed with finding the perfect strategy to win. And soon it didn't matter what elemental combination of fighting furies was sent against my army, none could stop me. But as I swept apart the competition with a strange psychotic ferocity for an eight-year-old. The flame of my conquering desire didn't dim, but shone far brighter. And so I looked for more RPGs to satiate my burning desire. From the Dragon Quest series to Fire Emblem to Final Fantasy to Suikoden 1 and 2, initially I played through every JRPG I could, then when I finally received a console and then PC, moved into the perhaps even better world of the Western RPG. But there was always one type I ignored, the CRPG. Yes, before you correct me, I know classic CRPGs were real time with pause, but I'm not a child of the 90s, but the 2000s, and my teenage years were in the mid 2010s. And at this point, everything had changed. You see, in 2014, a game would be released that kickstarted a turn-based revolution in the CRPG genre that was completed by the release of Baldur's Gate 3. Of course, I'm talking about Divinity Original Sin. Larian's most revolutionary title would abandon all convention and embrace much needed changes to the now archaic CRPG format. The rigid isometric camera angles of the old CRPGs were stripped in favor of 360 movement with a unique level of verticality. And real time of pause was swapped out for a sophisticated, but very much accessible and dynamic turn-based system. But nevertheless, I still ignored it. Yeah, at this point, in my ignorance, I was just too biased against the CRPG. It wasn't because they were old school. Suikoden 2 was hands down one of my favorite games of all time. It was because they and their fans seemed to take pride in rejecting progress. But as I fell from the Nautiloid, nearly 10 years after I rejected Original Sin, I started to realize how wrong I was. Straight away, the turn-based system felt like home. To say it was strategic 
strategically satisfying tremendously undersells the sheer level of improvisation and tactical possibilities it offered. Few games in their entire runtime enabled as many strategic maneuverabilities as even the most common Baldur's Gate 3 encounter. And we all have our favorite unique mode. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't spoil, but mine involved grease, a fireball, and levitation. So in the end, it was no surprise that in the blink of an eye, my initial couple hour investment turned into a hundred plus, and after days in the dark, on the verge of starvation, I finally completed my first CRPG. But now in a state of post and clarity, I became obsessed with deciphering exactly why I enjoyed it so much. What about the Baldur's Gate formula made it so attractive to myself and other CRPG noobs? There must be more to it than my surface level observation. But before I could really investigate what made Baldur's Gate 3 such a masterpiece, I had to answer a much more fundamental question. What actually makes a great open world role playing experience? In a previous video I did tackling the galaxy not far far away enough of Starfield, I developed a four prong criteria for successful open world storytelling to explain why things just didn't work out. And I believe this formula can be useful to understand why Baldur's Gate 3 works so well. For reasons I'll get into later, there's more to adapt in the modern CRPG, but I'll leave that, you have to stay on. And for now, it will do. In my opinion, great open world quests must achieve four things. They have to maintain the illusion of player freedom, fit in with the narrative of the player character, provide interesting choices and consequences that intertwine with the world, and be underpinned by stellar writing. The importance of number one and two stems from a distinct feature of open worlds, non-linearity. As the name role playing indicates, in a true open world RPG, players should have a great deal of freedom to tackle the game how they want to, rather than how the game explicitly dictates they must. No matter how far they venture off the beaten path, otherwise the whole open world concept becomes simply pointless as a right way to play emerges. Maintaining this ideal, however, poses a tremendous challenge for developers when combined with other expectations. For one, size matters. <laughs> yeah, boy. Modern gamers have become accustomed to worlds that aren't just large, but obscenely high production as well. Scope doesn't necessarily pose a massive problem for games with a lesser emphasis on role playing, but for a Dungeons and Dragons inspired game like Baldur's Gate 3, where the illusion of player freedom is everything, it creates a unique dilemma. You see the complex narratives with intertwining story threads that players expect don't emerge out of thin air, but require an immense amount of graft by devs that simply can't be automated. Writers, designers, and programmers have to personally hand graph a vast web of outcomes and character interactions that take into account radically different choices we may make from one another. And even if financial constraints weren't an ever-present reality of game development, it's not currently possible to offer unlimited freedom or true openness. Therefore, the best devs are the ones that can mold a kind of optical illusion that tricks the average player into believing their meaningful choices are not actually limited by a bunch of netbeards on Zoom, when in fact, they actually are. A good example of a well-regarded attempt to solve this most fundamental issue of open world is New Vegas. In the game, Obsidian subtly directs players through a fairly linear route to the iconic city by placing higher level enemies in regions far off the beaten track, but also maintains that illusion of non-linearity by not overtly restricting player movement. This isn't the only way though, however. CD Projekt Red and The Witcher does a fantastic job at maintaining their illusion of freedom, but through a more crude mechanism, recommended level caps. Quests and regions the studio want the player to access at a later date are separated into tiers through a recommended level system. Others, like like Ubisoft Montreal and Ubisoft Toronto and Ubisoft Milan abandoned the whole making interesting content business and tried instead to maintain the illusion of freedom in their games by oversaturating their maps with boring, repetitive content, consequently filling player inventories and maps with miscellaneous nonsense, or as they call it, quadruple A content. See, I'm greed. I want everything you can think of. Money and women, power and sex, status, glory. I demand the finer things. Like and subscribe. Apart from being the gaming equivalent of promising a reveal and releasing a 15 minute long cinematic trailer with five seconds of Idris Elba talking, this approach also runs the tremendous risk of crashing into the second hurdle to realizing the illusion of player freedom, making sure high stakes are balanced with narrative realism. Let's be real, as gamers, we want everything. We want to feel as though our player is naturally drawn to side stories because of who they know, who they are, and where they are, and not because the developers have decided that we are the main character and therefore get to break all the rules of the Matrix. And this is the area of Baldur's Gate 3 
really excels. At every point in its sprawling narrative, from a minute interaction in the goblin camp to the final act, which I won't spoil, calm down, calm down, the player is given a unique level of agency that pushes the boundary of what we thought AAA game design could achieve. The internet would have you believe this happened because Larian was simply more passionate and committed. But in reality, simply viewing Baldur's Gate as a product of passion understates the level of ingenuity that went into their approach. The world as Baldur's Gate is so rich with possible routes for the player to take because of their unique understanding of player freedom within an open world. They know why a game like Skyrim wasn't able to offer the same narrative depth as a game like Baldur's Gate 3 has nothing to do with laziness, lack of effort, or Emil Pagliarulo, but because of the unavoidable trade-offs that come with a completely open format. Now I'll explain what I mean with a simple analogy. Let's say I drop you off in the middle of London and tell you to go to Manchester without any time restraints nor instruction. Theoretically, there are a near unlimited number of ways you could approach this. You could go to Devon, whip round to Wales, run from Cardiff to Newcastle, then drive there to London. Or you could just take a train straight there. This is kind of the Skyrim model. After escaping a brief brush with police brutality and a dragon, you're thrust headfirst into the world, essentially left to your own devices. Now this sounds great in theory, but such unlimited breadth comes at a cost, a narrative one. There are so many unique player routes to be accounted for, that it would simply be impossible for their team to draft a complex narrative that accounts for every small decision in whatever order. Therefore, the choices and consequences one makes in each quest has to be fairly independent from each other. That's why it feels that you can do everything and anything without restriction in Skyrim, but have very little freedom to actually make a distinct impact on its world, regardless of how you choose to play. Whereas going back to the real life example, Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't drop you in a wide open area, but a train station and forces you to choose between five different options that lead you to another station with another five different options until the final destination is reached forming an almost indefinite number of combinations. In other words, they realized that if the number of routes a player could take to each destination was limited, but not too much, by dividing the game world into separate but interconnected hubs that were large and internally open, but only connected to each other by a small number of routes, then the player could simultaneously feel like they had so much more freedom than a far more open game like Skyrim without resorting to linearity. Now, if you can't imagine what I'm saying, surely Baldur's Gate isn't restricted. Just think of your journey from act one to three. Now it might seem that you're left to your own device after waking up on that beach without clear direction, plenty of questions, but no answers. But things are not as they seem. You see, there are only a few ways you can get from act one to two, and you have to pass through Moonrise to reach act three. So it seems like you're given far more choice on what order you'd like to play than you actually do in reality. Given Larry and the space to connect each narrative thread they found along the way in virtually unimaginable combinations. That's why the number of choices and consequences in Baldur's Gate 3 feels almost infinite, and why people thought Larry and were just more passionate and put more effort into their work than a studio like Bethesda, when in fact, creating a world like Skyrim is no more simple than Baldur's Gate 3. In many ways, it's more complicated. Now, if you don't believe me, just close your eyes for a second and open your mouth because I got a surprise. Nah, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking. Just think about how many routes you could take, the Druid's Camp to Moonrise versus Solitude. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe. If you didn't, no refunds.